We have two speakers now who are going to give us some individual insights as well as gauge in a conversation. So it's going to be a, a fun session. And we've talked a lot today about technology. We've talked about finance. We've talked about moving capital and future business models, grids, resilience, and sustainability. But one thing we haven't touched on much is actually the end user, the consumer. How do we engage consumers to participate in the energy transition? How, uh, what are the behavioral changes that will have an outsized impact when executed at scale? So to discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome Toby Park and Ravi Gurumurthy. Toby is head of energy and sustainability at the Behavioral Insights team, the UK-based global social purpose organization that generates and applies behavioral insights to inform policy and improve public services. He's the author of the report, How to Build a Net Zero Society, using behavioral insights to decarbonize home, energy, transport, food, and material consumption. Ravi is the CEO of Nesta and chair of the behavioral insights team. Prior to joining uh, Nesta, Ravi founded and led the Airbell Innovation Lab at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, and there he was responsible for designing, testing, and scaling products and services for people affected by crisis in over 40 countries. Ravi's also worked as a researcher at the think tank Demos and in local government in London, and he holds several board positions, including the Behavioral Insights Team, the Environmental Defence Fund, and the Health Foundation. Please welcome Toby and Ravi. Toby first. <laughs> Thanks. Afternoon all, pleasure to be here. So this is the problem that I focus on. If we're going to reach net zero, 62% of the emissions cuts we need depend on changes in consumer and citizen behavior. So the lion's share of that, 53%, is down to technology adoption behaviors. So of course, heat pumps, electric vehicles, a bit of retrofitting, solar, et cetera. Smaller portion, 9% more lifestyle changes around our diets, how we choose to travel, waste, and so on. Of course, the better job we do on the technology side, the less of the lifestyle change we need. But actually, even the other 38%, which is more supply side, is still not free from the social and behavioral challenges. Uh, we, of course, know that energy infrastructure, be it wind turbines, pylons, and so on, are subject to community consent. So really, the whole agenda is absolutely a behavioral and social challenge. The good news is that people are up for it, at least in the abstract. So in the UK, about 83% of people say they are either concerned or very concerned about climate change. Uh, a clear majority are in favor of net zero by 2050, and actually over half say that 2050 is too late. This is some of our data from a recent survey we did. So around nine in 10 say that they would like to make more sustainable choices in their life if they could, but they're also well aware that doing so is not easy. So 9 in 10 also say it's too hard to make more sustainable choices, often because it's too expensive, it's inconvenient, they have limited knowledge, and so on. And that, of course, is why a similar number want to see stronger leadership, be it from government or business, to make those choices easier. So that's what we think about. So what do we do about it? Well, I'm just going to give you four tips. So the kind of the mnemonic here is Go East. East stands for easy, attractive, social, and timely. So how can we make the green choices, the sustainable choices, easier? Well, one way we can make green choices easy is we can default them. So without precluding a freedom of choice to opt out and go with whatever choice you want, you can nonetheless make the default choice the green choice. A lot of people tend to go with the flow. We choose the easy option. We take the default as an implicit recommendation of what's safe, what's sensible, and so on. So studies have shown that if you default people into a renewable energy tariff, that can lead to a tenfold increase in the proportion of customers on that tariff, and, by the way, increase customer satisfaction as well. And of course, there's all sorts of things you can default people into without precluding choice, whether it's settings on appliances, whether, it's whether your pension is in a green investment or not, and so on. Another example, just to drive home the point, we significantly cut food waste in uh, hotel cafeterias in the UAE by simply defaulting people to a slightly smaller portion. They can go and get more if they want, they can ask for more, but by putting less on the plate to begin with, you can massively cut food waste. Number two, make green choices more attractive. Of course, there's lots of ways to make things more attractive. One is thinking about the incentives. So we ran a study with 8,000 uh, UK adults, homeowners in the UK, uh, making 24,000 hypothetical choices in an online experimental setting. We essentially presented them with a choice of a heat pump or a boiler in the scenario that their boiler needed replacing. And we randomized the upfront cost, the running cost, 
the installation time, which is essentially a proxy for hassle, um, and the payment method. I'll just point out a few uh, key findings here in terms of the proportion of people who chose to go for the heat pump over the boiler. So when you lower that upfront cost down to 5.5K instead of 10.5K, we see a 10 percentage point increase in the proportion of people saying they would go for the heat pump over the boiler. If you lower the running costs, so they're 20 pounds a month less than a boiler, as opposed to 20 pounds a month more than a boiler, we get a 7 percentage point increase in willingness to go for the heat pump. When you do both together, you get a 31 percentage point increase, which to me is kind of curious, because 31 is quite a bit bigger than 10 plus 7. But of course, what's going on there, if something's very expensive, it doesn't really matter if it saves you a little bit of money over time, a lot of people aren't going to want it. If something costs you more to run, it doesn't matter if it's only a little bit more expensive than a boiler, people are still not going to want it. But if you can do those two things together, we're actually more willing to spend a little bit more up front if it also saves us a little bit over time, and all of a sudden the decision makes a lot of difference. So you can get these sort of step changes in willingness when you bring together the right blend of policies and incentives. Number three, make green choices more social, more normal. We're social creatures, we tend to follow the crowd, we infer from what other people do as to what is safe, what is sensible, what is the right choice. That's why solar panels are literally contagious. There are studies in California and Germany, elsewhere in Europe, showing that they tend to emerge in clusters because the more visible solar panels are on your neighbor's properties, the more likely you are to consider getting them. It's also why, and many of you will be familiar with this, when you put social comparisons on utility bills or through technology-enabled feedback, we can reduce energy usage. If you simply tell people that you're using more than your neighbors, we tend to take that as a sign that we should maybe do more to cut our own energy consumption. And that's also exactly the logic behind the green number plates we've got in the UK, which we pushed hard for with the Department for Transport here, because, of course, you start to see EVs around you more saliently, you start to notice them more, you start to infer that they're more common, and thus you start to infer that maybe there's something in them. Maybe next time I will look into an EV when I'm changing my car. And finally, we want to make the green behaviors timely. So one way we can do that is by highlighting and harnessing timely moments of disruption or change when habits are already broken. These are precious windows to instill new behaviors. So we did some work with the city of Portland who are trying to promote a new cycle scheme. All we did was simply suggest that we target people who had just moved home. We ran a comparison in a randomized control trial between people who had just moved home versus a cohort who already lived in the area and found that those who had just moved home were four times as likely to take up the new cycle share scheme than those who already lived there. If you can get a 400% boost to your policy, essentially costlessly, just by targeting at the right moment in time, that's a big deal. But timeliness is also about bringing the benefits forward. As human beings, we tend to steeply discount the future. That is to say that upfront costs loom large in our mind, whereas uh, long-term savings tend to be somewhat discounted, more distant. So we want to bring the benefits forward. Simple way we can do that when it comes to appliance purchases, of course, the more expensive products tend to be slightly more energy efficient and save you money in the long run. Uh, we simply tested a new label design. So all we did was we took the standard label on the left and we tweaked it so that instead of kilowatt hours per year, which doesn't mean a whole lot to many people, we just put a typical lifetime running cost figure. We then tested that again in a randomized controlled experiment, testing hypothetical choice when presented with different options. And across all the appliances we tested this on, fridge freezers, light bulbs, space heaters, and induction hobs, we see a statistically significant and pretty meaningful increase in the proportion of people choosing the more expensive but the more efficient uh, product. So that's kind of behavioral science 101 in five minutes or so. Go east, make behaviors easy, attractive, social, and timely. Of course, there's much more to it than that, so I do encourage you to look into some of these reports if you're interested in more detail. Uh, and of course, we're always looking for partners to work with to try some of these ideas in the field. So if you're interested, do get in touch. But for now, I'll leave you and hand you over to Ravi to talk about some of Nesta's work. Thanks very much, Toby. Um, I'm now going to talk about the most boring innovation you're going to hear about, certainly today, but probably for, for the last year. People tend to think about innovation as snazzy, technology-related things, but this one's thoroughly dull. Um, how many of you have got a boiler in, the, in, this, in this room? Put your hand up if you've got a boiler. OK, last year, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. How many of you didn't turn down your flow temperature? OK. Interesting. Well, do so, <laughs> is my message. I want to tell you about this thing called the Money Saving Boiler Challenge that we did last year. And it's 
uh, an interesting in example of behavior change, and, and it, it puts into practice some of the things that Toby was talking about. The basic issue that we discovered was that when you think about gas boilers, they are typically at this 80 degree temperature, flow temperature, which is the, the, the temperature of your radiators. But actually, it's much more efficient to run them at a lower temperature of 60 degrees. We got interested in this because Nestor's mission is around heat pumps and heat pump, de heat pump deployments. And we wanted to see how we could get people used to the lower flow temperatures that heat pumps typically um, run at before Greg invented the, um, the high temperature one that he, he talked about earlier. And um, so we wanted to try and get people used to it. And what was interesting was when we um, looked into it, um, it turns out that uh, you, do that, you do that and it actually reduces the gas consumption by about 12% which is hugely significant in a uh, high energy bill context. But nobody knew that at the time. And in fact, when we started going to energy companies and going to government, going to regulators saying, let's do it, they immediately said, what's the evidence? So with Salford Energy House, we looked at that. We also looked at what's the, th what's the time it takes to heat up a home with a low flow temperature versus a high flow temperature under different weather conditions. And it was interesting that to get to 18 degrees, um, it actually takes the same time with a low flow temperature as a high flow temperature. It takes a little bit longer to get to 20 if you wanted to heat it up, up that much, but not noticeably so. And what was interesting was that we started this campaign. Um, we got a load of people involved, so lots of different energy companies, which magazine. Um, critically, we got Martin Lewis involved, um, the government off gem. Um, and created a very easy interface to sort of guide people through the journey. And the reason I wanted to mention it was the results. Um, last year, the ONS tracked who did this, and it turns out about 3.1 million households turned down their flow temperatures. And what that amounts to, as well as 500,000 tonnes of carbon, it amounts to about 500 million pounds of savings last year. So 300 million to consumers, and about 150 million to the Treasury because of the subsidies on bills last year. Now, the assumption is that next year, sure, it will be lower than that because bills have come down, but it will continue to recur. And at Nesta, we sometimes think about what, what's a policy unicorn? What's a one billion pound policy saving? I think this very small tweak, this very dull innovation, will end up being a policy unicorn. And I say it for two reasons. One, we tend to think that it's going to be very difficult to get consumers to do things. It is. But this shows that it is possible when you've got the evidence, when it's very top of people's minds because of the crisis, when you get influencers on board and all the companies and government, uh, it's possible to make quite a big change. I think the second thing is, for government, um, government was very reluctant last year to do anything on energy efficiency, and it shows that there is a big prize for consumers and for government in doing this. And as we put on board more burdens for, for consumers and ask them to take some difficult decisions, I think we've got to put as much effort as government, as regulators, as companies on the energy efficiency side if we're going to win that battle for legitimacy, which I think is going to be crucial. Now, I want to talk to Toby a bit more about some of this. Um, Toby, that's an old-fashioned comms campaign, if you like. Now, I'd normally say, and I think you'd probably say, information doesn't really work in shifting people's behavior. But is there a role for comms campaigns like that in the net zero transition? Yeah, thanks, Ravi. I mean, I think absolutely, and your success proves that to be the case. It's interesting, in behavioural science, I think it's become almost a cliche to say that information alone is not sufficient. Uh, often we see direct impacts of, say, conventional campaigns, labels, that sort of thing, of one, two percentage point shifts in behaviour. But I think mean, if, if the story stops there, then we're not doing them justice, right? Because to say that it's insufficient does not mean it's unnecessary, for one. Uh, we do know that there's still quite a lot of confusion and misperception out there. So we've got survey data just from the last year or two showing, for instance, that many people think that turning off your lights is more consequential in terms of energy saving than, say, optimizing or changing your heating system. People looking at net zero behaviors as a whole, people think recycling is more important than flying less or changing your diet. So there's a lot of misjudgment out there. And of course, we do need to inform people so that where there is goodwill, they will take the appropriate steps. Um, and I think this is the case in point, right? You, you started this uh, in a world in which hardly anyone was talking about flow temperatures. Uh, nobody really was aware that that was something you could do in two minutes to save a lot of energy. So absolutely useful. But I think also, of course, campaigns, information, awareness raising, and so on serves a really important secondary purpose, 
which is sort of building the wider public narrative, which feeds into you know, policy mandate, public support for the net zero agenda writ large. And we're, we're in a world where we're not looking at a need for sort of one-off discrete changes like this, important though they are. We're looking at wholesale changes to society. And to get people on board with that, of course, requires an informed public, absolutely. So what I thought we could try and do is go through some of the big um, behavior changes that are needed to get to net zero. So I probably won't focus on the, the ongoing optimizations like um, turning down your thermostat or um, you know, flexing your energy use or, or what food you eat, but let's maybe focus on the big one-off purchasing decisions. Let's start with EVs. I mean, you've seen um, a hell of a lot of adoption of EVs. Um, that early adoption has happened. Do you put EVs in the category of problem solved and the technology and, um, uh, and infrastructure is enough to carry on and the regulations are in place? Or do you think that the next leg of the journey is going gonna, is gonna to be difficult? Yeah, I think it depends how optimistic I'm feeling day to day. But I do think there's something quite interesting in that, yes, there's been a success story so far. We can look at countries that are ahead of us in the adoption curve and take some uh, optimism from that, I think. But what concerns me is that the success has been, I think, largely within a segment of the population that are ripe for being early adopters. We're obviously going to have to move that adoption curve through quite a different set of households. So for example, households that are far lower income, for one, and we already know that upfront cost is the biggest barrier to uh, EV adoption, but also households uh, who perhaps only have one car. Uh, so they need that car to serve all of their needs. They can't use the other car on the occasion they do a longer journey and so on. So of course, range becomes an even bigger issue. Uh, and also unlikely to have off-street parking. So we've got a situation where they can't get you know, cheap at-home charging, but they're going to have to rely either on more expensive public charging or we're going to need a lot of innovation in terms of curbside charging. So I think the nature of the challenge from a behavioral point of view is, is actually going to change. And if we don't get ahead of that game and put the policies and the necessary technological innovation in place soon, we might find that that adoption curve, I don't know, starts flattening off. Well, I haven't got a crystal ball, but that's, that's my concern. So one of Nesta's three missions is actually to, 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 home, to decarbonize homes, and a big part of that is obviously heat pumps. Um, let's take for granted that you do need um, regulation in place to phase out boilers by, say, 2035. The next biggest question, I think, is on the cost side. It becomes very, very difficult to regulate consumers to do something that is going to be more costly um, than the status quo. When you think, though, about the choice between doing stuff on the upfront costs, like the boiler um, grant, versus the, the ongoing running costs um, based on the gas to electricity price ratio, how do you, what's the behaviorally smart way of thinking about where to, to place the emphasis? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, I mean, people do discount the future, so upfront costs will tend to always loom large, um, sort of psychologically in, in the sense of how much we weight those incentives, but also, I mean, practically in the sense of you need the cash flow to cover an upfront cost or you need access to finance. So I would tend to focus more on the upfront cost, but, I, but honestly, it's both. I mean, when people are making these big investment decisions, they do tend to think about the long-term running costs as well. We saw from the study I put up a moment ago that both are important, but also both seem to interact and have an even bigger uh, a sort of impact in some. We've also got some other results just from some work recently, which is unpublished, but I'll just mention it briefly, which is to say that actually um, covering the expense of attractive finance, so for example, zero interest or very low interest loans that have like flexible drawdown that allow you to go through, say, a six or 12 month journey where you upgrade your home in various ways to the tune of 20 grand, whatever it might be. If you're in that kind of scenario, the costs of finance are also really, really important. And we found sort of indicative evidence to suggest that actually uh, zero interest loans might be as impactful as a £5,000 grant in that situation. So, you know, to government, the costs of backing or perhaps subsidizing finance, private finance, could be quite attractive compared to the costs of five grand subsidies in perpetuity, of course. Right. What about sort of more creative ways of framing this? So one of the things that I find frustrating about how government does things is that you have to um, fixate on a particular subsidy scheme rather than discover what's the right way to get customers to take things on board. So it might be more attractive for customers to have a year's free electricity. That might be a more salient, attractive offer than some meaninglessly, meaningless discount of a, pro of a product they don't know the cost of. Right, exactly. So fr framing, framing definitely matters. We've got a, a sort of relevant study actually looking back at EVs where Again, we ran an online experiment. We present people with a hypothetical choice. Do you want an EV or an equivalent petrol? I think it was a VW Polo that we used. Um, 
and this was a couple of years ago now when the EV grants still existed, but offering a flat discount off the upfront cost was actually quite a bit less attractive than saying, OK, you buy this at full cost, but you get 100,000 miles free. You know, imagine you've got like a fuel, like an electricity charge card that you can use either to subsidize your at-home electricity bill when you charge at home, or you can use it on public charge points. That was significantly more attractive, led to significantly higher hypothetical uptake of EVs over petrol cars, and yet we'd engineered it to be exactly the same monetary value. The 100,000 miles was the same value as the subsidy that was being offered. So the only difference was that we'd chosen to frame that, that incentive in a different way, and yet, it, and yet it matters. So of course, the same is going to be true when it comes to heat pumps, any other kind of high-cost um, tech adoption situation. I think one of the things we want to try and do is provide some sort of guarantee that your heat pump lifetime costs will be lower than if you stay on gas and you won't be exposed to that volatility. Some of the analysis we've done suggests that if you could get the electricity to gas price ratio down to 2.5 to 1, under most scenarios that is going to be possible uh, to, to guarantee that consumers that they will be better off and then financing can potentially take, out, take care of the upfront costs. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, and again, we've got loads of evidence on this, the main barriers to retrofitting your home, adopting heat pumps, obviously cost. Second tends to be hassle, inconvenience. Third tends to be risk, the unknown. If there's a sense of risk that, am I getting a good deal? Might the cost go up in the future? Uh, might this cavity wall insulation cause damp in my home? We tend to just revert to the default, the safe option. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't. So you just sort of don't do anything or you procrastinate, you don't get around to it and so on. So the more we can alleviate that risk, and of course financial risk, looking at future energy costs, et cetera, which are an unknown, is one form of risk, the better. So any kind of guarantees, those kind of golden rules where you will never pay more, I completely agree. That is you know, a good move. So that gets you to a, situ a situation where maybe um, this is a break-even or slightly cheaper um, offer to, to get a heat pump, and perhaps you can reduce the hassle. But what about making heat pumps um, a genuinely sort of aspirational product in the same way that EVs became that? So, you know, can you do anything on cooling, particularly with air to air heat, heat pumps? Can you, can you bundle heat pumps with smart heating controls um, or even solar PV to make it about a sort of whole home retrofit? Are you, do you think that's got value? Yeah, I kind of have mixed views on this. I think caveated yes. I, I think cooling potential is genuinely exciting, but how many homes are really going to switch to air to air? I don't know. That's quite disruptive, I think, in many, in many homes. Um, bundling, okay, great. But I think you know, heating as it stands, this might be a bit of a controversial view, I don't know. It's not the most aspirational product. But I don't know if it has to be, frankly. Everybody needs a heating system. So you've already got demand there in one form or another. You just need to steer it towards the right type of heating system. And if you can make heat pumps or other low carbon solutions both cheaper and as or more convenient, then you've probably won that game. So to the extent that there can be aspirational lifestyle products as well, I mean, other companies have done it, you know, products like the Nest, fantastic. But that's like one route to success. I feel like even if you can't do that, as long as they're cheaper, they're more convenient, and people trust them, then you're fine. One little study I will just add on to that, though. We have, we have looked, again, at sort of framing heat pumps in different ways. If you talk about the environmental benefits of them, that doesn't tend to land all that well. I think because the kind of people that are won over by that are the kind of people that already know that or are already interested in heat pumps. Whereas if you talk about increased energy security, i.e. getting off gas or increased value to the home, or kind of heating that works where you make a feature of that sort of more lower level ambient, more kind of always on heating, and you sort of emphasize that as a good point, those three framings seem to outperform more conventional environmental framings. So, there is, but, you know, we're talking about marginal gains here. You're talking about the sort of marginal benefits of talking about things in the right way. But ultimately, yeah, get them cheap, get them convenient, get people to trust them, and I think we'll be 90% of the way there. One of the aspects of your, fr of your framework is around messengers and how powerful those are. We saw that with the money-saving money saving boiler challenge because every time Martin Lewis went on TV or mentioned it, our, our website broke <laughs> um, because his power is so great. Um, one sort of slightly silly policy suggestion I've always had is if you think about heat pump adoption, why don't we give um, heating engineers free heat pumps so that instead of them sort of sucking their teeth saying what you don't want is a, one of those dodgy heat pumps, you want a gas boiler, a good old fashioned gas boiler, we actually get a kind of cadre of very influential um, people. I mean, is, is that sort of thing which, I know it seems silly, but it, it, do you think that's got potential? Well, I think at BIT, we love silly ideas. That's kind of what we're built on. And no, I, no, I agree. Um, 
yeah, as you suggest, we know that uh, heating engineers can be a bit, a, you know, a bit of a blocker at times. They don't always recommend a heat pump. Often they'll revert to a replacement gas boiler. But they do have the potential to be very trusted messengers. There's something we call sort of like convert communicators, which is to say that previous skeptics who have sort of gone through that process of being won over, they can be very powerful messengers. Plus, as I said, they're kind of inherently trusted anyway because they're known experts. So, yeah, if we can leverage them as messengers, I think that's great. Um, there are maybe others. I mean, Martin Lewis is always going to be in high demand. Um, but I guess our peers, our neighbors as well, we tend to trust friends and family a lot. So there's things you can do there. I think Nestor are thinking about show home networks, for example. So can you, you know, spread the word through the neighborhood, increase people's exposure to the new technology so that it becomes more familiar, they see their friends and family using it. It's a bit like that sort of green number plate idea I mentioned earlier. Um, so there are, there are things you can do there. I also think, going back to the grant idea, more novel approaches might be sort of refer a friend type schemes bolted onto that as well, because that almost comes with a trusted messenger built in. If it's like your friend that's pointing you in the direction of this grant and saying, do this to get a cheap heat pump, that kind of brings added psychological value alongside the economic value. And better yet, the kind of people who are most likely to buy heat pumps probably know someone else who was either bought a heat pump or is also sort of an early adopter segment, right? Because we tend to have friends that are perhaps in a similar kind of socioeconomic group to us, maybe live in a similar area, perhaps have similar-ish kind of houses, similar views, attitudes, etc. So we can sort of like load in these more kind of psychological nudge type flavors and approaches to these more conventional tools like grants, subsidies, and incentives, and so on. Another part of your framework was about the timing of making, when you make a decision, um, I think you, you had one or two examples there. What's the, what's the right moment in time to actually get people onto this journey? Because I think one of the problems is that your boiler might break in the middle of winter. The last thing you want then is people coming and saying you need bigger radiators or, or, or other stuff. You, you're going to probably go for the easiest, quickest option. Is that, not a, bit, yeah. is that not a big barrier? I think it is a big barrier. We know that a majority of boiler replacements are done at a distressed purchase when a boiler is broken. As you say, that's likely to be in the middle of the winter. You could buy a new boiler, get it fitted, what, within 48 hours? That's a very attractive choice. It's safe, it's a known thing. Uh, in comparison, starting that journey of heat pump adoption at that moment of distress, when you need to get the heating and the hot water back on, that is not ideal. So to the extent that you can move people along that journey in advance, get their homes heat pump ready, get their mindset sort of towards the notion of getting a heat pump next time your boiler fails, that's really important. The other thing, and I mentioned the sort of um, the Portland um, cycle share scheme example earlier, when people have moved home, moving home is a really powerful moment for all sorts of things. And of course, retrofitting heat pump adoption is one of them, in that you know there's probably going to be some level of disruption anyway. You might be doing some light or heavy renovation works. Uh, you haven't like filled your attic full of stuff, so it's a good moment to insulate it. So leveraging that moment is important. The question is what you do at that moment. Of course, again, we can think about incentives. So. We're certainly not the only people to have talked in the past about some kind of stamp duty linked incentives, so linking stamp duty to EPC or some kind of measure of um, carbon emissions of the home uh, can, be, can be, I think, a, a really powerful thing. But there are going to be other smaller moments as well, like even when you perhaps are building an extension or doing up your kitchen. These are moments of disruption to the home where if you can bundle in additional behaviors, they kind of had you know, less additive cost and hassle. So it's, it's a good moment to do it. Just finally, one of the big challenges of, of doing this and some of the other work in Net Zero is the workforce and how you um, train up a, a potentially pretty big workforce. If you think about the ramp up in heat pumps, we've got to go from about 60,000 now to 600,000 in 2028 through to you know, over a million in the 2030s. Um, and and that's, that's a huge workforce that needs to be trained. What do we know about trying to do that quickly? Um, now, obviously, you know, the signals around demand will hopefully naturally feed into people to the training up, but often that can take time, and there's uncertainty yeah. about the transition, uh, and we can't really afford there to be a sort of uh, a problem where we, we don't really have the capacity to, to do this. That will start to impede the transition in its own right. It will. It doesn't only take time, but this, you know, it can become a bit chicken and egg, right? The demand might start to come up, but if it's still hard to get one because there's not enough installers, that's going to quash the demand again, increase costs, etc. And so that demand will sort of level off. So you have these sort of negative feedback problems between supply and demand. Um, obviously, policy certainty and commitment is a key thing there, such that 
big installer firms, manufacturers and so on feel confident in investing in that kind of labor force, knowing that this is definitely coming, not just maybe coming. Um, but again, there are going to be other discrete policies we can look at, whether it's sort of mandating a certain number of apprentices within large firms, that sort of thing. Um, one landmark policy which I'm actually a, f a fan of, um, I know, you know there, there's been some critique of it as well, is the market-based mechanism that is proposed coming in um, by government. That is to say, for anyone that might not have heard of it, essentially a tradable incentive on heating manufacturers to incentivize them to sell and install far more heat pumps and sell and install far fewer boilers. And the beauty of that is it doesn't try to micromanage. It doesn't try to um, uh, sort of overrun the fact that the market knows best and innovation will prevail. It just sort of pushes your thumb on the scale of the market and sort of tilts the incentives in such a way that heating manufacturers will want to sell you a heat pump now rather than being ambivalent as to what you buy. Um, and so from that, you would, of course, expect all manner of innovation, hopefully including in the sort of installation space as well as the home survey space. Surely there are smarter ways we can do that with big data and so on. So my hope, just to end, I guess, on a more optimistic note, is that those kind of upstream sort of market-oriented incentives will trickle down and start to remove some of these frictions, whether it's in the amount of noise that heat pumps generate, whether it's in the adoption process for customers, whether it's in the home survey journey, all of that we need to sort of iron out the hassle and the frictions. Thank you very much, Toby. Just one thing I just wanted to end on, which is I think we saw with the backlash with ULEZ just what happens when we fail to sort of think really hard about the consumer and citizen. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that gets amplified through the political system. So um, when I was in government, there were lots of engineers and economists and commercial people that were talked to, but not enough people who actually understood human behavior and how we, um, how we sort of go with the grain of that. And that's not just about communications. It's about really thinking about a behaviorally informed way, designing policies and subsidy schemes and the whole uh, system uh, that we've been discussing. So um, with that, we'll, we'll end. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Toby. Thanks, Charlie.